Hello, and of course, welcome to this, our 60th episode of the Duels of Man Dorks podcast. I'm Connor. And I'm Sam. We are not brothers. Nor are we in a dungeon. And uh, we are the Dungeon Bros. I should have. Wow, I just totally fucked that up. I, I, do you want to take it from the top? <sighs> I don't know if I'm going to leave all this in, but of course, welcome to this, our 60th episode of the Duels of Man Dorks podcast. Uh, we are the Dungeon Bros, and I'm Connor. And I'm Sam. We are not brothers. Nor are we in a dungeon. Yes, that is the correct way to do it. And now I'm definitely going to leave them both in. Uh, yeah, it's hilarious. I mean, I'm really tired. For those of you that don't know, Friday was my birthday. It was. My birthday. I'm 29. I'm an old man. I'm aging I, rapidly. I've been 29 for months. Yeah, you're an old man. And aging and rapidly. rapidly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, this weekend was a bit of a blur. And next weekend, I got, or this coming weekend, I got a lot of shit to do. Yeah. So... We're kind of living. We're kind of living that busy life right now, which is a great time. Um, but we wake up on this Tuesday, February it's Tuesday, February thirteenth, to record this podcast. The fattest of Tuesdays, in fact. It is a fat Tuesday. It is a fat Tuesday for those that celebrate. I love the um, the the like Jewish little like custard filled chocolate covered donut, donuts yeah. that we can get at the. We've been going like, hard on those. They're fucking phenomenal, okay? And I'm not gonna be I'm not gonna be shamed for my love of a Bavarian cream chocolate covered donut. I'm not big into filled donuts. Here yeah, you wouldn't be into being filled. <laughs> we're 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 putting this out to the public. Yeah, exactly. So we woke up on this the Lord's Day of Fat Tuesday, mm-hmm. and we were like got a couple things we can talk about there's some rumors is whatever and it's like oh hello we got release dates baby yeah one D &D release dates finally and we got some thoughts we'll get to that when we're talking about the upcoming releases for uh magic and for dungeons and dragons we also got some rumors that were proven false by wizards very quickly by wizards they they put the kibosh on it real quick there were rumors going around about hasbro wanting to sell the rights of D &D Mm d to 10 cent games which We'll, we'll get into that. We'll get into that. We got uh, the Joe Manganiello uh, Dragonlance series being canceled, kind of. It's it never really picked up. And then no. some wrap-up items, which will be fine. But uh, this episode of the Duels of Manadors podcast, of course, is sponsored for real this time, actually, 100%. <laughs> uh, by ourselves, we're starting a new podcast, Why Did They Make It Sexy? A deep dive into Magic the Gathering cards that we like to call Mommy. Uh, of course, this whole trend started when we both pulled a copy of Elish Norn, Mother of Machines. Right, Elish Mommy, Mommy of Mommies. Elish Mommy. Um, but we can't forget other great cards like Ink Eyes, ooh. Servant of the Oni, who is a sexy, sexy rat. Or if you want to look at the card for yeah, what, no, Armadillo no, 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 we're, we're not, we're not just moving past the sexy rat comment. This is supposed to be my bit. <laughs> we're good. You're going to make the sexy rat and you're going to expect me to not part. comment on the sexy rat. Really? Ink eyes. Yes, I know ink eyes and they make the rat sexy, but. Yeah. but Okay, what else? What other what other sexy cards we're we gonna talk about? Uh, the armadillo cloak art. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I'll pull that one up right now. Armadillo. Ooh, if I could spell armadillo cloak. Uh, Ooh, uh, I want to call out. I want to call out the anime art of the new feather. Not feather the. Re- oh fuck! All right, titties. Hello. Damn. Uh, the new feather, not feather the redeemed, but feather something else in the anime art yes. is a little is a sexy little anime girl. Um, Stitcher supplier, mm, a one one mm. zombie that they also it's mm. like I let her step on me. Yeah, I mean fair. I mean fair. Ooh, massacre girl, just in all oh, the absolutely all the iterations of massacre girl. Um, and we made the joke about Elish mommy, mommy of mommies. That that head's weird. You know, we might need to we might need to brown grocery bag it, but she, with how much machine she is, like more machine than man. There might be some interesting functions there. Who knows? There might be some interesting functions, but of course, that episode will probably never see the light of day. <laughs> For the sake of humanity, <laughs> we'll never see the day. Yep. Um, I'm going to do what we're what we've been playing because I don't want to jump into talking about the guests that we've been having on the podcast after right that, after that massacre right after that. Um, but 
I'm, we're working. We're working over here. I'm going to start this time. I'm going to start this time. Right. I've got, of course, I'm working on the Call of the Nether Deep campaign. Thank the Lord. Um, but what we have a bit of an emotional. We have an emotional, bit of uh, tragic Magic the Gathering deck building news, and one of my first commander decks. One of my first commander decks that I made from scratch. Tovalor Dire Overlord, a werewolf, a gruel commander deck. I think it's time that that he be he be taken off to the pasture. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, at one point I took this deck and I split it into like a dual purpose Oathbreaker and Commander deck using inner sleeves and like marking the inner sleeves on the front face to be like these are the ones that are used for the Oathbreaker deck, and then you can pull them out and do that. I'm probably going to just retool the Oathbreaker deck part, so he'll be in a deck. Yeah. Uh, but then we're going to take a lot of the good gruel bits, and we're going to take them, and we're going to make uh, Yars of the Old Gods, the new um, Murder to Karlov Manor commander deck with face-down things. It's a haste enabler. It draws cards like Tovalar. Mm -hmm. uh, free flipping for morphed and disguised cards, which I think is the big thing for me. That's why I never really interacted with that yeah. mechanic in the first place was... The it was a lot of mana to cast it and then flip it. Yeah, it wasn't. It's not necessarily super um, meta in in commander. Obviously, yeah. in, in smaller formats, it could have very impactful things going on. But absolutely, Yaris is definitely a strong commander for yes. that. Yes, and in the realm of video games, mm -hmm. my newest addiction, Persona Three Reload, has been out, and I've been going hard. I'm like thirty hours in already. Um, I just now got all the party members, which is great. Cool. cool. Fantastic. Uh, about halfway through the big dungeon that is that runs throughout the entire game, Tartarus. Mm. It's got like, I'm not even halfway. It's got like 250 some odd floors in it, and I'm at like 105. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of like a, you played Persona 5. It's like Mementos. Yes. A bit. Um it's actually very similar to Mementos in a lot of ways, this version. The old version was a lot more grindy, a lot more monotonous, uh, but in the in this remade version. Persona 3 Reload, highly, highly recommend. And as opposed to Persona 5 and Persona 5 Re uh, Royal, which are like 90 and 120 hour long JRPGs, yeah. apparently Persona 3 Reload's closer to like 75, 80. Okay. So a bit more reasonable in the time commitment time frame. So that's what I that's what I've been up to. Same. What have you been playing? Well, let's see. Uh, some D and D, of course. Actually, this past weekend had some very, um, very a very long D and D session um, in our Star Wars campaign, uh, which is actually coming to kind of a wrap up point. Oh, really? This game started back in 2020. We had two sessions before lockdown started, and uh, talking to our our friend who is DMing Salem, they said that. Uh, back in like November, they said maybe 15 to 20 more sessions and we're about, I think three to five in since then. So hypothetically by the end of the year, I might actually finish a campaign for the first time ever. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, so that's exciting. In I think, I think you're going to get about 10 more sessions in and then it will be like, ah, but I got this great idea for another arc. We'll just do one more arc. <laughs> well, the thing is one of our friends, uh, is planning to move states mm. and so like you know going from uh right now i'm the f person who drives the farthest at about an hour yeah uh but she and her uh boyfriend are moving about eight to ten hours away oh yeah so uh we're trying to wrap that up and then maybe do another campaign maybe do some who, who knows what we'll do next mm -hmm. but yeah feel free to invite me to that you're never available I'm, I can make myself available. All right. We mostly play on Sundays at 1 in Dayton. In Dayton? I mean, I might be a little bit late. I get off work at noon. Mm -hmm. Dayton's how far from downtown? Well, less than an hour. Well, I could get there, like, right at 1 then, maybe, <laughs> <laughs> if, I, if I don't hit traffic. Also, you don't like Star Wars. I mean, I don't dislike Star Wars. I'm just not, like, thrilled with Star Wars. I like Star Wars in concept. But in, like, movie practice, not as much. Yeah, the movies have never been the greatest things. The video games have been always my favorite parts of Star Wars. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, as far as Magic the Gathering goes, though, I have been... I built a, a uh, Duskana the Rage Mother deck. Mm -hmm. So, a bunch of 2-2s. Two uh, that was my, that was my uh, building requirement, is it either had to be a 2-2 two -two or a card that created only 2-2 two -two tokens. Mm -hmm. Um, and if it wasn't a 2-2, two -two, 
that created a 2-2 token, doesn't matter. doesn't get in the deck. Uh, but I've got those cards on the way. Nice. And then in the realm of video games, actually very exciting, I've been spreading freedom and democracy to alien worlds in Helldivers 2. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I've been hearing a lot of good things about Helldivers. It's it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, it's not it's not overcomplicated. It's a third person shooter. Um, big explosions. It looks it looks like there's a little bit in the a little bit go, too much going on for my own ADHD in the like um, like the UI. I feel like there's a lot of stuff on screen. Yeah, I mean, it's not bad. I don't, I don't think the Hell Divers is any more like complicated on screen than necessarily say like a Call of Duty game. That's fair, that's fair. But uh, it's all, it's also not Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League. It is not Suicide Squad <laughs> Kill the Justice League. You and are that, correct. And that that UI is a fucking disaster. Also, can we talk about how Rocksteady took nine years to make a game, and then it's like a six hour kind of shitty looter shooter? Yeah, right. With the Suicide Squad, that sucks. Anyway, um, before we get into the upcoming releases and the news for this episode, uh, we want to shout out uh, some of the bonus action. Uh, it's a new little sub podcast, little extra, little extra maneuvers that we're doing over here at the Duels of Manadorks podcast. Uh, we had on several weeks ago Randy Sackett of the Forged Realms. We talked about three D printing in D anD D. We talked about our Gen Con experiences mm-hmm. together. Uh, just last week, we posted our podcast with the Bearded GM, another one of our friends from TikTok. He stayed with us at Gen Con, and uh, it got a little, got a little weird. Yeah, yeah. it was good. Yeah. It was a good weird. He and I, he and I are two sides of the same coin in many ways. You are uh, one of those that you know you flip into a fountain and out comes some sort of weird monster. Mm. Oh yeah, it's like if you were to go to oh, what's the name of that fancy fountain in Italy that everyone? Oh, I've no idea. That one. You flip the coin in, and then a fucking hole breaker comes out or some <laughs> shit. You know. Uh, and then next week, this one I'm actually this one I think you guys will really like. Um, we had Ivy, a uh, gamer rated girl. From TikTok, she is the CEO of the Crit Awards. Yeah, uh, the Creator Recognition and Tabletop RPGs uh, Awards. They had their first annual award show last year at Gen Con, uh, and they're ramping it up even more for this year. They got new categories. Uh, we go over the entire process of creating the Crit Awards, uh, what some of her partnerships have been, who's been helping out, uh, what some changes have been, and got a little exclusive, little exclusive info in there. That will go live next week, February twenty first, at the same time as our regular podcast, uh, twelve thirty p.m. That'll be a really good one, and it's also a little shorter, a little, di- a little bit quicker, more, more digestible. digestible experience, which is also pretty nice. But Sam, we got some upcoming releases to go through and. It's good. Yeah, it's um, juicy shit. Actually, before we jump in, you want to pull up that article, and we can, I can read. We can read through that because oh, that is directly remember. related to the upcoming D and D releases. That's right, D and D twenty twenty four rules refresh has been finally announced. We just talked last two weeks ago about how the actual dates had not been released. Yeah, uh, they had said it so in an interview. It's been an eerily long time of just like radio silence and it's like guys we're in the year yeah what's going on but here we go uh so this is a a article from polygon wizards of the coast has been teasing the next revision of dungeons dragons fifth edition rule set since 2022 at the same time working to temper fans expectations while managing multiple controversies including but not limited to the ogl debacle the ogl debacle a particularly heinous round of holiday layoffs by its corporate owner, and a complicated recall of defective products. Um, With the uh, the TTRPG's official 50th anniversary last month, and it passed without so much fanfare from its owner. Then on Monday, Withered shared the news briefing containing a particular release calendar for the next 12 months. Buried at the bottom was the fact that the Monster Manual the third and final book in the revised set would not be available until February 18th of 2025. Almost a year from now. Uh, yeah, that's that was that was the biggest thing. Um, for in my mind, it's like we we were talking about this a little bit before we started, but the complete. Like, like they're spreading out the three core books a lot. Yeah, 
which doesn't make a whole lot. I'll let you. I'll let you. With, with the player's handbook coming in on September seventeenth of this year, the Dungeon Master's Guide two months later in November, and the Monster Manual, of course, in February of next year. It's it's one of those things that, like, obviously, the only thing that you need to play D anD D is the player's handbook mm-hmm. that has the core rules that has all the the all the big choices that you would be making yeah. in the game in terms of character creation uh the dungeon master's guide not as important to even really have yeah but uh-huh. it's weird that they're not choosing to do all of this at the same time you'd think they'd want to bundle it together like they've like done so often in the past and I could totally, I could, like, I get separating the monster manual a little bit just because, like, the player's handbook is going to have some stat blocks. Mm-hmm. Uh, the dungeon master's guy is probably going to have a couple of stat blocks. And then you can use old stat blocks. In fact, that's a, that's supposed to be a key feature of this revised is, edition is yeah. you can, it's all backwards compatible. Absolutely. So I, I, and Hasbro being the way that Hasbro is, would they not want a complete boxed set of these three books available right after Black Friday with alternate with alternate uh, covers as they are so known to do exactly I mean they've been working on these books for a very very long time um, and are still working on those books yeah and it's it it just seems like a bit of an oversight a bit of a weird decision to make to spread these books out i mean obviously people have been complaining a lot about oversaturation mm-hmm. ourselves included in absolutely the, in the release of D books but that's for supplemental content like this is core content for the game you know it it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me and especially since these are like we said not necessarily not necessary to play the game mm-hmm. or or mm-hmm. uh, this is revised and so what happens when that if that player handbook comes out and everybody's just like well this was completely useless and just tosses it to the side and grabs their 2014 again yeah like then there's no going to be no incentive to buy the other two yeah if the if the player base for whatever reason rejects the player's handbook which i am don't imagine that would happen the, with the play tests, people have been very happy with a lot of the changes and of course the people that are doing the play tests and giving their thoughts in the review period are going to be the ones that are most heavily involved in wanting new D D content and like they're they're the they're the power users mm-hmm. of the game in a lot of ways. So this is going to be a lot of people's first exposure to some of this stuff. And I'm sure there's going to be that shock value of yeah. some of the changes that they have been making that we all know about because I I can't imagine anyone that listens to this podcast or listens to us talk about this shit also is kind of like, I just don't really pay that close attention to D&D, you know? But I will say, I'm I'm sure there's probably a video a video out going to be made by several creators, maybe us included, where we go, Mm -hmm. hey, if you downloaded all of these things throughout the year, you just need to pay this one and put it on PDF and this one on PDF. And we put this whole PDF together that's just the player's handbook with all the updates that you need. Yeah. And... Like obviously, playtest material is never the same as the actual books. The the books never are never quite the same. The there's always a couple of little tweaks. Also, the books are just in a presentation manner, just much nicer, That's easier true. to read, better organized. Of course, they have the arts. Yeah, big it, big. There they have a big draw on the arts coming. We've already seen one, but they've got a whole new array of art coming. Yeah. So every class, uh, I think every race and background, or sorry, every. Species, species, which oh, that's so much more reductive. I can't like, just call her. Just say heritage. Sure, heritage. Yeah. I think is a fine term for it. Okay. Anyway, uh, they also gave some release dates for two other books that are yeah. coming out this year. The new, the uh, upcoming adventure, I Vecna, Eve of Ruin. Uh, it's a level ten to twenty campaign, and that is set to release on May twenty first of this year. And we also have the quest from the Infinite Staircase another anthology book and that is set to drop on july 16th of this year and along with every one of these if you order them through dnd beyond you will get the every publication two weeks before the physical release absolutely and there's they're also doing a weird they're doing a weird little like history book yeah as well uh we i i, I can handle yeah, go this. for it yeah it's, uh gosh the making of original Dungeons and Dragons, nineteen seventy to nineteen seventy seven, uh, set to arrive on June eighteenth. There are no digital options, but it is a unique history book 
uh, courtesy of New York Times bestselling author and historian John Peterson, who also did uh, Game Wizards, The Epic Battle for Dungeons and Dragons, as well as the Heroes Feast official Dungeons and Dragons cookbook. Uh, it's just kind of it's just kind of a book that goes over the inception of Dungeons and Dragons, including Gary Gygax's never before seen first draft of D and D written in 1973, as long as along with a curated collection of published uh, fanzine and magazine articles that contributed to D and D's origin story. So that's kind of just a fun little history piece, kind of like a mm-hmm. coffee table book, not really. Uh, the kind of things that most players are going to be into, but if you're it's a collector's piece, it's a it's a collector's piece, and it's going to be a pretty nice one at that. Um, well, we can finally stop complaining about the lack of release dates. True, it's really weird to me. It's really really weird to me that this was all all this information was handed out on a Monday outside of the 50th anniversary yeah. of the game. That was only a couple weeks ago. So I want to, I like, it's almost like maybe their marketing department might be a little bit short staffed or maybe. something. Maybe. A little thin. A little skeleton little thin. crew. Maybe. Who knows? Who knows? That's not that's not our judgment call to make. But, of course, we're very excited for 1D&D. D. I think the player's handbook is going to be very solid. Mm-hmm. I, I would be shocked if the, the, if the core three books were not very solid. Um, with with the the lack of um, care that's been put into a lot of products over the past two years, they're really going to have to make sure of that. Yeah. To keep yeah. Uh, not only to of course bring it. You know, there's always a new influx of players when you change editions because it's like oh something new. Now I can pick this up. Now it's it's fresh to, to not just me but mm-hmm. to everybody. But. So, but you also don't want to lose your old players, yeah, um, who have been spending money on you for years. I will say, I am also very pleased that we're going to have a, a fairly long period without a D and D book release for a while, right? And like we at the be at mid February that we are, we have what March, April, May. We have three months until yeah. the next D and D book, which. In some ways, is like, aw. But at the same time, it's like, Vecna, Eve of Ruin, if they're giving it this kind of time, it's a level 10 to 20 adventure. They've never made a level 20 pre-written adventure before. Yeah. And they've all, they've already kind of hinted that it's going to be this kind of, like, this, this kind of, like, giving a send-off to the original 5th edition and kind of wrap up a lot of stuff. Um, and then, of course, Quest from the Infinite Staircase. The anthology books are always some of the best books oh, that yeah. they make. Uh, I did see that they're going to take one of the adventures from Quest from the Infinite Staircase and publish it uh, for free on d d Beyond mm, okay. in the very near future so that it can be used for like tournament play for yeah. stuff starting in March. Actually, if you scroll down weird. to the bottom of this, the Polygon article mentions... Uh, in addition to these releases, including projects that have been announced, uh, highlights include adversarial tournament-style play that was common with older versions of D&D. Uh, there will also be footwear and apparel from Converse, an official Lego ideas building set complete with many figures, and a delicious treat suitable for snacking around the gaming table from Pop-Tarts. Yeah, Hasbro be hasbro and with that one for sure. Um... I'm not. I'm not opposed to companies licensing their IP to other companies to create collectible products for people that like that stuff. I got nothing against that. It's always just cringe hearing them talk about it. Oh yeah. Um, the Lego Ideas series of Legos, from what I understand, are like some of the best line of products. Like they have a lot more care put into them. Yeah, Lego is is pretty um, pretty They're on good. the ball. They're good. Converse has been popular for. I mean, we're all we're millennials here. Oh yeah, like, Converse has always been a thing. I've got a pair of Chucks. Uh, I don't. Also, Pop Tarts. Yay. <laughs> you know, you, you got know what my favorite Pop Tart is the 2002 tie-in Spider-Man Pop Tart. Can you be the a person? wild berry? You know, they did, They did. if you remember, they did uh, Hot Pockets for MTG. Oh, my God. And now they're doing yes. Pop-Tarts. They just want non-ravioli raviolis mm-hmm. to, be, to be included with your nerd shit. 
I guess they are all handheld sort of ideas. Um, the getting the codes for Magic Arenas is the is right. The, yeah, I remember I, you you bought I got just a couple for that. Bo- I got I got like two boxes of Pop Tarts or Hot Pockets, and that was the first time I got Hot Pockets like like in a very 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 long time. And they're fine. They're hot pockets. They're they're hot pockets. Hot they have not pocket. changed. Hot pocket. All right. So in the freezer aisle. Indeed, indeed. So that's the big news item for today, and we haven't even gotten into the news yet. So no, let's uh, just give a quick rundown of all the release dates. So Mar- uh, Merge the Karloff Manor is out now. Um, if you're, ma- sorry, we're moving on to magic. Merge the Karloff Manor is out now. The Fallout decks come out March eighth. Outlaws of Thunder Junction is set for pre-release uh, April twelfth, with the full release April nineteenth. Modern Horizon 3 is set for June. The Assassin's Creed Universes Beyond is set for July, with Bloomborough coming in quarter three, and Duskmorn House of Horror coming in Q4. Yes, and another quick rundown of the D&D books. Vecna Eve of Ruin, May 21. Quest for the Infinite Staircase, July 16. The Player's Handbook, September 17th. The Dungeon Master's Guide, November 12th. And then the Monster Manual, much later, February 18th. 2025, over one year from now, Mm -hmm. if you're listening to this as we record or post. Yeah. That's a long time for a for a compendium of monsters. (laughs) I feel I always felt like the monster manual would be the easier ones to produce. You'd think. Because like they have a they clearly have a format. Sure. For all of their stat blocks. And you kind of just need to plug in the values. I mean, obviously you gotta play test all of the stuff, but like there's a there's like lore blurbs but we're not doing like these long protracted like descriptions and rules tested like like a monster's a monster right it's a lot easier it, it's it's like when it comes to homebrew some of the easiest things to make magic items monsters and then the next level is like spells and subclasses and feats and, feats and stuff yeah and it's like that that's a lot that's stuff that a lot of people can do so i i'm, I'm kind of surprised that they are there's this much of a difference that makes me kind of excited like is there going like is it going to be a chonky are they going to like monster manual include every monster are they going to i know with um more recent publications and especially with the D beyond ones they changed the formatting a little bit on the stat blocks and of course on the D beyond ones making all of the oh if it has this spell it's you can now like hover over it and see it or if it has this yeah. ability um so maybe maybe something like that, maybe simplifying or maybe overhauling. Who knows? I know they were wanting to. Re- they've already kind of reordered how stat blocks are, and that's been evolving as five e books have been yeah. coming out. Uh, I like the method of like here's your static features, then here's your actions, here's your bonus actions, yes. here's your reactions. I think that is a great way to organize things. And honestly, moving monster stat blocks away from spell slots. Yes. And just using, like, they can cast these spells once per day. They can cast these spells three times per day. They can ke- cast these at will. I think that's just an easier tracking method for Absolutely. a Dungeon Master. When, when you, as a Dungeon Master, are maybe running four, five, six monsters. Yeah. I do, I've do. i also heard of uh, methods where DMs will, uh, yeah, like, hand a monster stat sheet basically over to... A player and be like mm. okay you're also tracking this monster's hp and uh you know spells whatever um so but it's options it's I th- options i i i imagine that a lot of these stat blocks that we're going to be getting are going to just be reformatted ones from likely previous monster likely. which even makes it weirder that it would take this long but unless it's all trying to be in it's it maybe it's the the D beyond aspect of it that's taking that's going to add that extra yeah, time that's fair at formatting linking making sure all the hyperlinks work yeah. everything like that 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 would make a lot of sense too all right let's get into the meat uh there was a big controversy that was going around uh it was a it was an article that was originally published on uh pan daily which is like a, a new, like a like a Chinese news site in English, mm-hmm. um, and they were reporting that another publication in China, Speed Daily, exclusively learned that the American toy company Hasbro was seeking to sell the Dungeons and Dragons IP to really anybody, but the main quarter of the IP was Tencent. Uh, Tencent, for those of you that do not know. They, 
how do how do I how do I do this unbiasedly? Because <laughs> uh, Tencent is a is, Tencent is a Chinese company that has been known to buy stakes in entertainment companies internationally, and by buying stakes in these companies, buying controlling stakes yes. in these companies, coming out of a media conglomeration base almost. Yeah, Ten- Tencent is a, is a is a Chinese multimedia conglomerate. Yeah, in a lot of ways. Um, and you know that I'm gonna offer my opinion. You can disagree. I'm not a big fan of of Chinese Communist Party entities buying up everything. I think that's a little bit suspect, in my opinion. But this kind of this kind of rumor spread so fast. Oh yeah, like this was this article. The original article was published on January 31st. And within, like, a day or two, Hasbro gave their own statement. Uh, Wizards of the Coast, sorry, gave their own statement. Uh, specifically, the statement was given to Dice Breakers, which was reporting on this uh, the following day on February 1st. And they said, quote, We regularly talk to Tencent and enjoy multiple partnerships with them across a number of our IPs. We don't make a habit of commenting on internet rumors, but to be clear, we are not looking to sell our D&D IP. We will keep talking to partners about how we bring the best digital experience to our fans. We will not comment any further on speculation or rumors about potential mergers and acquisitions or licensing deals. So putting the kibosh on that immediately. Yeah. Uh, the main partnership that they were discuss that they were referencing there is of course Larian Studios that made Baldur's Gate three. Uh, Tencent has a controlling stake in Larian mm-hmm. Studios, uh, along with countless other entities and countless other IP that they happen to own or have controlling stakes in. Um, It's one of those things that I'm surprised that people don't think about what they're reading a little bit. Because I I read that Pan Daily article before they gave a comment and I'm like, "Mm, this kind of sounds like they're just looking for licensing things. Because like Hasbro of course, is hemorrhaging money. Yes. It is loss of blood hard. And yes, they laid off a lot of Wizards of the Coast employees, but they have to know, they have to know that if they were to sell off D&D and Magic or one or the other, then that's basically like you're in your boat, it's got some leaks, and then you you have you take a fucking chainsaw to the hull and you just run around the entire thing and you lose the bottom. You know? Yeah, fuck the bottom. Yeah, fuck the bottom of the boat. What is that important for? Yeah, I think that, you know, if we'd seen, oh, Hasbro is selling Power Rangers or is selling Peppa Pig, we would, that'd be much more believable immediately. Absolutely. Um, And I think maybe part of the the immediate reaction of a lot of people was the fact that nobody's happy with Hasbro right now. Yeah. And so to hear, oh, it's going somewhere else, this thing we love might be going somewhere else to maybe somebody who cares more, is probably the first, is probably going to be an initial reaction of a lot of, as is a opinion yeah. I've heard from some people. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I did the same thing where I, I, I saw another, I saw another TikToker post about it, um, and I was like, that doesn't sound right. Yeah. Well, it's, it's one of those, you gotta have your bullshit detector on for a mm-hmm. lot of this stuff. I think it also helps that you and I are just kind of naturally skeptical people. Oh, we're horrifyingly skeptical people of everything. And so, and we have been proven wrong with the OGL stuff. We thought, oh my God, absolutely. We thought, no, 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 that can't be right. And, after, and two weeks later, we were like, okay, so oh. now we have to reevaluate this. Yeah, because but, it, was, it was one of those, the OGL was one of those things that it was just like so outlandish to think that they would be so audacious, bra- audacious and brazen to behave in that way i'm like surely it's overblown there's probably some things that aren't that great and it's like no it was arguably worse than yeah. people were saying uh and then ultimately i think it ended up in a much better spot than it was even before the sure. controversy right now the ogl all of that is in a much better position for creators it's just now everybody has that like Ugh, what are you doing yeah um with it with this with tencent with selling with with the potential to sell ip I don't I don't really agree with the people that would be excited for them to sell D&D to a separated entirely 
from the Chinese Communist Party controlled and sanctioned and like their entire executive board being card carrying members of the CCP. That separate entirely. So even if they were selling it to an American company if or, they were or selling, a Canadian company. Yeah, if they were selling it to Microsoft. Yes. I wouldn't be happy about that. Do you know how massive Microsoft is? Mm-hmm. Tencent is massive. They're not going to give a fuck about the D&D IP. Look what look at what Microsoft has been doing with the studios they've been buying for Game Pass. Yeah. They just they had this massive merger with Activision Blizzard King and they just laid off a bunch of people. Yeah. They don't give a fuck. They're just trying to get they're just trying to extract value out of these organizations for their own bottom line. And ha- that's what Hasbro is doing. Oh yeah. And them just giving it to a different one isn't going to improve anything. No. It's going to just disrupt their entire workflow, make products worse for a period of time, and then maybe they never get better. And then we just lose these these products and this these games that we really love. I would be very very skeptical of organization of being happy that organizations are selling their IP to other large corporations and organizations. Yeah, I think that I mean, we're we've we've seen a lot of this dis dislike for Hasbro and Wizards mm. of the Coast, and that I think fuels a lot of people's thoughts on how things should be. And we're coming into an era of more indie TTRPGs. Of course, indie TTRPGs have been around for all, for ever, oh, since yeah. since the beginning, obviously. Oh, yeah. um, but now, I think we're going to see. You know, if if Hasbro just explodes or just bleeds out, mm. they they do like you said. They just took a. They're like, oh, let's take a chunk here and put it over. Oh, now we have a different hole. Anyway, but if if they if they sink, you know, I, I think we might. The only time D and D might become this this new refreshed love of the community indie thing that people I think are wanting. You know, uh, from companies like path that we see with pathfinder and we mm-hmm. see with the new MT, uh, mcdm ttrpg i think it's going to take yeah hasbro completely dying several years and then somebody picking up the ip yeah i'm it, it would be it would have to be a bankruptcy fire sale mm-hmm. and in a in the best case scenario for me it would be wizards of the coast is owned by hasbro if hasbro goes their ownership company goes their best case scenario is by themselves out. Yeah. Uh, that would be by far the best. If Wizards of the Coast was independent, I think, and I think very evidence-based, and I, I would hold very, very firm that if that if Wizards was spun off into their own entity, much like how Alta Fox wanted them to when we were talking about that last year. Oh, two um, years ago at this point. Oh, two years ago. Fuck. God, we've been doing this for a while. But if they spun off into their own entity... That entity is going to be treating their IP with a lot more care and polish and drive to improve than Hasbro would, than Tencent would, mm-hmm. than any other mega corporation would. The third party developer Microsoft would for video games. Yeah. Like, that's, oh, it drives me crazy when people are like, yeah, they should just, Microsoft should just buy this to, oh, Microsoft just bought Activision Blizzard King, Sony should buy, should buy Square Enix. And it's like, no why why would we want this right like we don't we don't need to like bring in house everything and just own everything like everyone being separate creates better products it creates better competition it create everything's just better let there be more things let people choose um yeah i'm kind of Obviously, they're not. They weren't going to sell the D and D IP. Hasbro is probably going to go out of business. Uh, I was actually talking to my brother. My brother is on a Star Wars podcast, mm-hmm. uh, the Outer Rim Guild, Outer Rim something. I can't remember. And they talk about Hasbro toys all the time, right? Because Hasbro owns the rights to so many Star Wars, yep. uh, Marvel. Oh yeah, um, and just. A, the price, B, the quality of the products. Uh, my brother, for my birthday, went to the Ollie's discount store. You'll remember, we've talked about Ollie's on the show before because of the campaign cases. Yes, originally $60 products that people were finding for three at yeah, Ollie's. Yeah, uh, another thing that we now own because it was gifted to me, uh, the D&D board game Warriors of Kryn mm-hmm. that was released alongside 
the uh, Dragonlance campaign setting. A Last product, year. a product that was like eighty dollars. You know um, how much? You know how much it was bought for? How much was it bought for? He bought it for ten dollars, and they had a stack of like fifty of them. Yeah. So, I that's a Hasbro. That's a Hasbro thing. I've been saying it for a very long time. We've been saying it for a very long time. Those that kind of product, dish, like that kind of push, that's not Wizards of the Coast. Mm-hmm. And Tencent wouldn't be any better about it. No. So. That's all I have to say about that. You got anything else? Yeah, let's move on. All right. In more kind of sad news, <laughs> uh, Joe Manganiello. Joe Manganiello has been working on a possible live action Dragonlance project for a while. Uh, he's got some bad news, though. Joe Manganiello, in an exclusive interview with comicbook.com's Chris Killian, uh, he was former. He was an actor on True Blood, and the Justice League is also a very, very big player in the magic in the D and D space. In uh, bo- both a player, as in somebody who plays it, and as also a influential personality. Both are true. Both are true. Uh, he confirmed that a proposed live action Dragonlance project that he had been working on for years was no longer going to be moving forward, despite the script receiving high praise from several Hollywood producers. Quote, Dragonlance is not a property. Wizards of the Coast are interested in developing further currently, end quote. Uh, He said the planned project was not moving forward due to several issues, including Hasbro's sale of the E1 studio and the poor performance of the Dragonlance D&D adventure and board game released in 2022. Yeah. 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 Uh, as, reason, as reasons for why the project was not proceeding. In the interview, Manganiello spoke about the work he spent attempting to turn Dragonlance novel series, which features a group of heroes fighting against the dark goddess of dragons and her forces of evil. Manganiello worked with a script writing partner and consulted with novel writers Tracy Hickman and Margaret Weiss on the project. Quote, Tracy and Margaret were all about it. It was real. It really got me getting in there and fleshing out the world they built and a world they hinted at in some places, but didn't shine. Didn't shine the magnifying glass on. Uh, he also mentioned that it was inspired by HBO's treatment of True Blood, which was based on the Southern Vampire Mysteries novel series. "Quote: What I had planned for the first season was mind blowing." Talking about his plans for the series. I just, I want to make the Dragonlance show because I want to see it and I just want to feel that excited and electric about something. The characters, like the casting, I have to, I have a lookbook with over a thousand pages, but it's not what you'd expect. The design concepts I had for the world, for the armor, for the swords, I had a fresh take on what the dragons were going to look like. It was going to be nothing like anyone has ever seen. And these beloved characters that have been read by, I think Tracy said, there's 35 million copies in circulation. So he had also shopped it to a bunch of other studios outside of Hasbro and E1. I'll give one more quote here. Quote, The biggest fantasy literary agent in town, he said, and these are his words and not mine, that it was the best fantasy pilot he had read since the original Game of Thrones. There was another executive that read it and said it was one of the best fantasy scripts he's ever read. I actually got an email just this morning from a producer who said it was awesome and that he wanted to send it to the rest of his company in hopes that I developed another fantasy IP. I didn't write the script that I didn't write a script that was terrible. Calls were made to say, this is what you should be making. This is what you should be doing. But currently, it is to no avail. Holy fuck. Yeah. Um, Hollywood executives don't talk like that. (laughs) Like, about 99% of things. That's not what they talk. That's not how they talk. No. Everything is negative. They're always trying to get it redone to how they want. They want their improvements. They're always giving notes. To have a glowing reaction like that i mean obviously joe when he works on something there's a lot of love and care put into it there's a lot of people in this space where whenever they work on something it's like that's their thing but like to get the original writers of dragon lance in uh i met those writers at gen con i got a book signed for my brother oh yeah that's right uh, for his and you met joe yes and i met joe in line there which is pretty cool obviously that's why he's, (laughs) he's been doing stuff with them yeah um that's really fucking disappointing. It's amazing to see how Wizards of the Coast slash Hasbro 
can can look at their own, can look at the ideas they come up with and go this is great and then flop and then we hear of somebody who has deep deep love of these things and and who is working with the people who originated these things dragonlance being mm-hmm. one of the most popular um planes of of all times mm-hmm. And obviously, thirty-five million copies of a book is not is nothing to sneeze at. Yeah, it's a it's a series that's been going on for decades. Yeah, like it's it's not to the level of a Game of Thrones or a Lord of the Rings in terms of public popularity. Yeah, it's a little more niche. But you're not going you're not going to have a series as long running as Dragonlance with that many copies sold because it doesn't have the possibility for that broad appeal. It just hasn't really tried to. No, and if you have somebody at the helm of it who cares deeply about this and isn't, it, they aren't here to just to make money, you know? I think we see that, we've seen that obviously with, um, oh my, his name is escaping me, Superman. Um, Henry Cavill. Henry Cavill, and his, the reason he's no longer on The Witcher, mm-hmm. and how mm-hmm. he's also no longer Superman, and also, and how he was starting the Warhammer show. Yep. And it's like, these, this is the, you know, it back, back. 10, 15, 20 years ago, it would be like, oh, look at this fan film that's being made. And now it's a fan film that's being produced. It should be, could be produced professionally. Yeah. Being shopped to Hollywood executives. And Hollywood executives are looking at these scripts and being like, this is good stuff. Let's see if we can work something out. And then Hasbro saying no. Mm -hmm. That's, again, it comes down to a complete lack of awareness of where it's the mega corporation problem, the complete lack of awareness of where they hold their value, of where they get, where they could be getting the most value. Yeah. And it's not hard for Hasbro. It's not hard for them to say, Joe, this looks great. You've got a lot of interest. We can talk about licensing. Yeah. And we can license it to Warner Brothers or to whatever massive Hollywood studio wants to produce that. Yeah. And they and they could very easily shop that out for very little effort and they would collect a very hefty uh licensing fee and wouldn't really have to do a lot of work. Yeah. On it. it I mean especially it sounds like Joe wants to one you know would want to be in charge and he'd want to do the work as opposed to, you know, sometimes I'm sure it's like somebody comes up with a script. All right. Here you go. Yeah. Here, make this. It's it's one of the... It, it's the difference of the original Star Wars versus prequel Star Wars versus sequel Star Wars. Mm-hmm. Where the original Star Wars was, they were scrappy, they were writing the scripts themselves, it was their pas- passion project, and that showed through. Same with The Lord of the Rings. Yeah. It was their passion project, they showed through. Uh, with Star Wars, with the prequels, I believe it was George like, I've got all these great ideas, and now I can just do it. Yeah. And he just kind of did it himself again, but he didn't have that scrappy mentality anymore. Yeah. And then with The Hobbit, with Lord of the Rings and Peter Jackson, it was, hey, we're making a Hobbit film. You can either be involved or not be involved. And that shows. Yeah. And we're making it a trilogy, and you can either be involved or not be involved. And it shows. And then the sequels... Here's scripts. Uh, there you go. Make this movie now. Yeah. But I want. We're Disney. Make this movie. Yeah. We're Disney. Make this movie. And they're like, but we, we want to do certain things, which is why you see a lot of threads that are introduced and then dropped, and then yeah. introduced and then dropped in those three movies. And this, this is one of those old media versus new media problems that we're probably going to have for another couple decades. Yeah. We might be resolved by the time we're. Elderly. Maybe. <laughs> God forbid we make it that long. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a new media versus old media thing. And you need to find the people that are passionate about projects and then giving them the ability to do those projects. And not only that, do them on the appropriate schedule. Like, appropriate we've, scale. We've been doing this. We've seen this with Marvel where it's like we love Iron Man. Iron Man 2, Captain America, all those old... Some people don't like Iron Man 2. Well... I'm not one of them. I love Iron Man 2. People talk a lot of shit about Iron Man. Uh, but anyway, all of those old... And then you hit the... You know, we get to this epic end of an arc with Endgame. 
and then it picks up again. And we, as people who, you know, we were watching and re-watching and we're like, and we're discussing these there's, very heavily. And there's closure. And then we're then opening it again. We're picking it up. And, and we watched for another year after that oh of God. all the, of all the show releases of all everything. And it's just like, okay, they're pushing. They're like, we need to have, we need to have the WandaVision out. Well, we had, need to have the super, the, uh, the the Captain American Winter Soldier and now we need to do this and this and and it's just like we're tired. The we're- biggest the biggest red flag that a lot of people missed, myself included, was all right, Comic Con, w- what's up? You like Avengers: Age of Ultron? Oh yeah, whatever. All right, here's our entire slate through Avengers and then Avengers 3 and Avengers 4 Mm -hmm. and we didn't know the titles of it then and then eventually they were like Infinity War and people "Ah," lost their fucking minds and now you look at it and they finish Endgame and it's like here's the next four and a half five years of movies and it's like I'm sorry what? Yeah. You you you're already planning you're already saying you're going to do these things when like who wants an who wants an echo disney plus show yeah who who <laughs> want even though it was great who was asking for moon knight yeah moon knight was a great show like and i get i get having you know a company having a five year plan that's good if they didn't i'd be very confused but it's it's not only just the the it's the rate at which they push them out we would have been fine the, with a show a year and the brazen act of Hello, public. Get hype. Yeah. Because this is what we're doing. And it's like, that's way too much. <laughs> it's the frequency. It's the... It, it's the... the pro- Magic has this problem. Marvel has this problem. Disney has this problem. D&D had this problem. They've kind of slowed down. We'll see how that picks up next year when yeah. all the 1D&D core books are out. But people need to, like, take a step back and... It, it is it is ultimately and as as much of a free market capitalist as I am that is the downside of free market capitalism is it's like you gotta grow you gotta go you gotta grow you gotta grow you gotta get bigger you gotta yeah. make more you gotta get more more investment means more hands in the pot means we need to make more to satisfy those hands yeah and I'm telling you right now Hasbro would be completely foolish to refuse to license dragon lance to any any studio that would be willing to pick it up they'd be foolish they were foolish to get rid of e1 <laughs> that was that was really stupid and now that they have it's like all right well license your shit yeah and as far as owning popular ip goes licensing them is the easiest thing to do to make money yeah by far so Joe, uh, f- tough shit, dude. Sorry. <laughs> That's highly unfortunate, but it is what it is. Wrap up time. Wrap up time. Foundry Virtual Tabletop. They just had an announcement and it is currently live. They are partnering with Wizards of the Coast and Dungeons and Dragons, and they're incorporating official D&D content into the Foundry Virtual Tabletop. It includes uh, tokens that have the official art from the D&D books. Uh, The Foundry VTT uh, system is going to have all of the rules and all of the features and spells and classes that you can get in the D&D Player's Handbook, and I believe a couple of others as well. Uh, everything's going to be right there available for you. They have map integrations. Uh, you can manage tradi- uh, conditions. You can track the various effects that you have to track. Uh, their d d maps that are now incorporated with their lighting engine in their virtual tabletop. All of it very searchable, very like interactable. Uh, their, ooh, the dynamic token engine, which is a cool thing that they do, I guess. I don't know. There's going to be 150 of those featuring real art. Uh, all of that out right now oh also the included bestiary Mm, for all of the uh all the stuff they were announced uh the game system update happened on january 30th and fend over and below the shattered obelisk is available on the foundry vtt as of february 1st as well you know licensing their products but i find that the, the, the main reason i wanted to talk about that was 
it's interesting because they want to develop their own virtual tabletop. Yeah. And now they're like, here, you can have this virtual tabletop that already is very popular and highly used and honestly a little bit difficult to get into. It's very dense in its mechanics. And it kind of is its own game in and of itself in some ways. Um, Here, you can have it. Is is interesting. I want to see... Either this speaks to the confidence that they have in their own VTT to be able to stand out yeah. and be that platform and integrate it with D&D Beyond, which if they don't, I think would be completely foolish of them. Uh, or it might be the start of a partnership with Foundry where Foundry works with Wizards to create, to like further develop their VTT mm-hmm. and it becomes more of an ongoing partnership. I don't really know. Um I mean, Foundry also looks very different. It has a different feel than the the tabletop that that uh, mm-hmm. Wizards is developing. So maybe it's one. Who knows? Maybe it's a thing. It's, it might be two different markets. Two different markets. God, God forbid they like they're like thinking like, ooh, we'll do it now, and then we'll buy them later. Maybe. I mean, that's that's what a lot of that's what a lot of companies do. They I could. Mean, they're, what... they're 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 uh, what's the like priming them for? They're plumping up the pig. Mm-hmm. And I mean, because uh, like we were looking at it and I was saying that, oh, I mean, yeah, it's all the official art and stuff, but it just looks like they just took the, the um, D&D Beyond database and ported it in. Kind of. But they didn't integrate D&D Beyond. They did not integrate D&D Beyond. Which I think is kind of the point, because they were like, you can't touch D&D Beyond. We'll yeah. give you the assets and you can use these assets and you can make them work with your lighting engine and all of your development and interactable maps and tokens mm-hmm. and all that kind of shit. But the integration with D&D Beyond, I think, is going to be exclusively reserved for their own VTT, which uh, I kind of find interesting that they did this partnership in the first place. Maybe yeah. just to kind of... I, th- I think what they're doing is... Obviously, Foundry paid for this. Mm-hmm. Um, and it looks, from from their announcement video, it looks like it's just Player's Handbook plus Fandelver and Below the Shattered Obelisk, which is fair. Yeah, it might include like the Xanathars and Tasha shit. I don't know, but this kind of a product is—I don't think they—they're worried about it competing, and it's one of those. I think this is just a push of like get D and D back to the people for a little bit, give it give it time, and give people more access. Like they're playing D and D more, mm-hmm. playing D and D more, and then when they come back with their refresh, it can be like, boom, here's all this shit now. Yeah. Because I think they've lost a lot of people, and this might be a just their true. attempt to get people back. You have anything to say? You don't really do many virtual tabletop stuff. I don't. No. Even, even with your friend moving eight hours away. Yeah. Yeah. You should be like, fuck it, we're ending our campaign now. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Lastly, this is our wrap-up item. Altered TCG uh, is a Kickstarter that started, what? Two weeks ago. Two weeks ago that uh, had an original pledge goal of 50,000 euros. Uh, it is a an indie trading card game that within the two weeks that it's been live, of the $50,000 goal, it has raised $2.8 million. Yeah. You might be thinking, wow, people really want just an indie trading card game that much? Well, it's not just an indie trading card game. It is an entirely new system of getting you cards. Yeah. They have a booster pack. They have starter decks that they're going to come with. But the main draw is the the cards themselves. You're going to get cards out of a booster pack. And once you have that card... You can contact, uh, what is it, Equinox? Equinix? Yeah. Equinix? Yeah, the, Equinox. Yeah. Equinox, the company, and they will print to demand that card for you. And this uh, also goes as far as they have, they're have. they going to have a companion app where you can also keep your cards in a database of sort, and, uh, and, use, and you can trade them on that app to other players. And then once you have those, you also own them. Mm-hmm. You have a you have an, basically an NFT of them. Kind, you know, it, it's it's NFT light. Yeah. Um, because you are getting the physical cards, and simply having the card enables you to basically buy a playset of it from the company directly. Yeah. So they so they they mentioned in the article is you no longer have to crack a pack trying to get that fourth 
that fourth of the play set or for that specific uh he, here they're called heroes mm -hmm. that specific hero you want yes they also have the foiler card uh which i think is very interesting that this one this one is the one where i'm like that is interesting uh, a foiler card has a qr code for foiling another card of the same rarity you will then be able to order a foil versions of that card using their print on demand service uh, the foiler is consumed on use uh, foiler cards come in three rarities common rare and unique uh, another fun thing uh, this game is being designed by Regis Bonassi. That's French. I can't do French. Uh, the publisher of Dix Mysterium, and as well as the designer of Dice Forge and Seasons. Uh, they they've partnered with a lot of. They have they have makers that they have uh, people who help make a Hearthstone and also Magic the Gathering people in there. Yes, it's. The, f the fact that it got funded so quickly to such a massive degree mm -hmm. is very, very impressive. They got over a million, like, almost immediately. On their on their Kickstarter, it has a band that says the 50,000 goal was funded in two minutes. Yeah. Two minutes of the posting. So this is a very big deal. Uh, currently has 7,367 backers. Um, a new way to distribute... Trading card games. Yeah. So it's 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 going to be an interesting field, you know, for the this almost moving the physical product away from the point of yeah, you know, it's going to be at the point of sale, but there's gonna be very little that aftermarket's gonna be almost all digital probably. You're not gonna see a lot of you know you're high, probably not gonna see a lot of um like uh booths at conventions and things that are selling second-hand cards at this rate. I, that is true. That is true. Which I think is their business model point. Mm -hmm. They are... they They're kind of developing a way that cuts out a lot of the secondary market. Yeah. And then gives them those sales. And as long as their prices are reasonable, that's also going to be a boon for the consumer as well. Because Absolutely. If, if, oh, I pulled this rare... And I can get a play set of it directly from the company shipped to me for like ten bucks. That's a value. That's a pretty good value proposition. And oh, I also got this foiler, so I can make one of them a foil. And that's kind of in a that's a a issue a lot of people have with you know uh, obviously Wizards Coast and Hasbro are very very um, guilty of this. Uh, Konami is also uh, guilty of this when it comes to Yu Gi Oh. But it's like they know what cards are valuable on the secondary market. It's like, why do you think we, we, you know, we, oh, look, suddenly we're putting fierce guardianship in this, into Commander Masters, so now you can crack it, and we're also going to put, uh, it's going to be, you know, a 25% more expensive to buy a Commander Masters pack, mm -hmm. you know, that, so that's, that's very they, blatantly not what they want. They don't, they're yeah. not trying to sell you more packs, they're trying to sell you initial packs and then get you to buy printings. Yes, and that is the, that's going to be the key thing. If there's a powerful card in Altered, mm -hmm. Altered TCG, then there can be an infinite number of those cards. Yeah. Because if you crack that pack, you could buy, I don't know, we don't know the pricing on these, they haven't really said that, but you could buy as many of them as they want, mm -hmm. as you want, because you have the one, and now they'll print on demand as many as you would like. So, see, I think there was a uh, price in the, uh, where's the reviews and previews? You can keep talking, I'm going to, I'll be. So, there, well now, you, well, now you completely derailed me. You fuckwit, you whore. You massive bitch. You stretch goals. I'm an idiot. So it seems to me like their attempt to cut out the entire, well, maybe not the entire secondary market, but they're, in a way, it becomes consumer friendly because consumers can get any of the cards that they want for what will be compared to powerful magic cards, powerful Wakana cards, powerful whatever, yeah. flesh and blood. Those rare cards, you now no longer have to just crack from a pack. Yeah. You can now order directly from them, and they will print for you. They also are saying that if you wanted to proxy and print your own, they're totally fine with that. Um, oh, here we go. Ooh, so they have they have prices for packs uh, in terms of... In, well, actually, those are just shipping. 
but shipping estimates without add-ons. I saw I, I saw something earlier and was kind of giving comparison. If you you know if you did the uh, because it's in pledge tiers, I'm an idiot. Here we go. Um, so here we go. MSRP for um, two decks, two pre-starter decks, and one booster box display would be 174 euros, so probably about 200 bucks. Mm-hmm. Um, and right now it looks like you're getting about so it's 150 euros, um, so closer to about 170 bucks. So it's it looks to be on well for two decks and two then decks a booster and box. a booster box of 36 packs. 36 pack box for magic for most sets is around that price when it comes out. Yeah. Um, and magic booster boxes, I don't think are 36 anymore. I think they're close to like 32 for some of them, right? Um, maybe. But ultimately, ultimately, I think this is a consumer friendly move. And it's also a consumer friendly move that directs business at the company instead of third party mm-hmm. um instead of third party resellers and, yeah. and, and secondary market options, which is both good for the people that want to play the game and then also good for the company that's making the game. Uh, I am intrigued to see if there is going to be a a notation or something that distinguishes a card that was pulled from a pack or a deck oh, versus versus a printed on demand card. So like you couldn't necessarily trade your printed on demand cards hypothetically. Well, possibly. In, in person you absolutely like you could trade whatever, but well, I mean, the printed on demand cards probably don't hold the same kind of value on their own like internal marketplace that they have would be my suspicion. Um I did know so there are so one of the one of the tiers rewards is going to be uncut sheets, but uh the cards wherever they were um, had QR codes on them, so I'm wondering if the print-on-demand cards just don't have a don't QR have code. the QR codes. That would make that would make sense because it would kind of it kind of would defeat the purpose of their own market. To oh yeah, if you had one of these print-on-demand cards, you can also then print it on demand. It just kind of creates like yeah an ever-growing fractal of of ownership, just a spider webbing out. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. I yeah. So we've seen we've seen cards that come out of booster packs, and they have a QR code in the bottom right, which I would assume is how you scan them into your database, their database on their app, and then that's how you are able to then order more cards from them. Yeah. Um, and then the the foiler cards also have QR codes on them, and those are consumed when you use them. Whereas if you order cards that you have in your collection to be printed on demand, uh, though you they you still own them, and then you can take those cards and share the digital ownership of them and trade them to other people or sell them to other people. Yeah. So yeah. it's a whole weird NFT light thing, but ultimately it seems like it's going to end up as being more consumer friendly and probably really good business for them. I mean, obviously they've already raised almost three million dollars for yeah. this, so they've got two more weeks to go. So. Uh, props to Equinox Studios. Check out Altered Games on Kickstarter if you are so interested. And those are the news items for the day. And we're going to end this podcast as we always end our podcast with questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and or ideas from the TikTok live chat. We record this uh, podcast live on TikTok every other week on Tuesdays around noon Eastern time. Podcast goes live the following day, Wednesday at 1230 p.m. Eastern Time. You can get the podcast on Apple, Google, Spotify, YouTube Music, our YouTube channel, uh, wherever you get your podcasts. And you can also follow us on TikTok because that's where we gained our, our notoriety, if you will. You also got to go to our uh, Instagram, and YouTube, and Twitter, and Discord, and all that kind of nonsense. Sam, mm-hmm. what do we got from the TikTok live chat? We don't got really much. Uh, Party Source said, just hopping in. What are we riffing about? Everything. Everything. I'm always riffing. Mm-hmm. And then Phil Good just asked what game we were talking about. We were talking about Altered. 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 Right. Nothing Nothing really in nothing chat? Nothing really in chat today. Oh, wow. That is surprising. All right. Well, we're done. Interesting. That's yeah? Fine. That's totally fine. Well, I have a question for you, Sam. All right. Why are you such a bitch? Um, you know, probably the, uh, the economy. Mm, mm, as well mm -hmm, as mm -hmm. um housing market housing market yeah like i can't wait for that shit to crash dude i'm i'm excited for when we can you know slide in and and steal a nice uh two-bedroom ranch out from under a family of four who can no longer afford their mortgage yeah yeah fuck them fuck those families of four the nuclear family (laughs) 
<laughs> the American dream? My American dream is um Part of me, part of me. Okay, this is this is completely. This is ostensibly a Dungeons and Dragons and Magic the Gathering podcast. Yeah. I, I part of me like kind of doesn't want to own a home because like I don't want to fuck with landscaping. I don't want to like all oh, the fucking water heater is leaking now. I don't want to have to deal with that myself. I want to tell someone that owns it to be like, hey, fix it, and then that's all I need to worry about. You know. See, I those things don't uh, like. Here's the thing. So a couple years ago, I lived in a different apartment with a different roommate, and dead of winter, our water heater went out. Mm. Mm. I very easily could have just gone to the Home Depot or the lowest, as in Lowe's, but they do the thing in their commercial where they say lowest prices. Anyway, and just bought a water heater and had them install it that day, next day. Who cares? It took a month and a half for my rental company to get us a new water heater. In 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 defense of my position, you had a re, you had like the worst rental company in Cincinnati. The the company that then was being investigated and fined and sued by the city because they were that bad. Well, yeah, but still. <laughs> as far as I mean like land, I will say the place we live now, they're very good if there's a problem. Yeah. They're usually here within a day or two. They fixed your toilet within a day. That was imp- that was shocking. <laughs> so the porcelain... I, I didn't brick the toilet, okay? The porcelain in the tank cracked Yeah, from top to bottom. Not... Yeah, and, and nothing was... Dry. We were gone when it happened. Literally, we were not... Ha- we were away on a trip, and I came back, and I'm like, why is there a wet patch in the ceiling? Oh, God. And I went up to my bathroom, and there was water everywhere because it had been dripping out of a crack that formed in the porcelain when no one was home. Yeah. That was an, that was a weird thing, but they got it they got it pulled out and replaced. They they came in, they went, "What the hell?" They had they were sh- we were like, "I know, right?" <laughs> now, did they come back in and paint the ceiling to get rid of the water stain? No, but that's also a very low priority thing. You know. And every time they're, they they used to do quarterly, now they do biannual inspections. They used to come and go, do you know what that's about? I'm like, yeah, it's in your notes. And they're like, oh, okay. Okay, we'll get we'll get that fixed. And then they don't. Because, I mean, when it comes to the hierarchy of importance for maintenance, it's like, oh, painting over that water stain from a problem that doesn't exist anymore, that's not a priority. <laughs> and I don't I don't care. Oh yeah, we, we don't we barely look up. Yeah, when we when we leave, when we leave this abode eventually, they'll be like, Oh, we'll fix that, and then they'll paint it and it'll be fine. Oh yeah, great. <laughs> uh, all right. Well that is all that's all the time we have for this episode of the Duels and Mana Dorks podcast. We are nine episodes away. Yeah. Nine so, episodes until the big boy. So till, only five and a half nice, months. No, only four nice. and a half months. Nice. We've considered going weekly a couple of times. We would need to have more time in our own schedules. Yeah, we would need. We honestly, the the big different differentiating factor it would be the ability for this to more monetarily support us. So if you enjoy listening to this podcast, please do the things like review. Ooh, reviewing on the podcast services is the biggest thing. Give Bye us five far. stars. Send us to your best friend. Yeah. Uh, tell them. Share it. Tell the, your best friend that this is the reason uh, you're you're no longer a virgin. Sam, I've told you dozens of times to quit fucking our fans <laughs> Brandon can only take so much and his wife isn't very happy <laughs> uh, Brandon Vole one of our one of our fans and, and good friends I'm not doing the last bit anymore I'm kind of over it alright yeah well then then I'll do the last bit of um, of just saying dumb shit that's everything you say and I'm, I'm just gonna cut out the filter from now on oh so remember folks uh, if if you are if you are None unhappy in life. Um, I don't know where he's going with this. I don't know where I'm going with this either. I'm just kind of, I'm just kind of going. Uh, just remember that it's all Connor's fault, and that if you have a big problem with him, you should let us know on every one of our videos. Mm-hmm. Okay. You sound like my ex. We love you. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>